Welcome to the Evolution Show! About half of all the energy we use today involves heating, and most of it comes from burning fossil fuels, and this needs to change fast. We invited the CEO and founder of Absolicon, Joachim Byström. This company has developed the most energy efficient solar collector in the world, a technology that can become a game changer for the energy sector as well as help us combat climate change. Join us for an inspiring conversation. And don't forget, give us a thumbs up if you like the show and consider subscribing. Now, let's get going with the conversation. This is The Evolution Show. Welcome to the Evolution Show. I'm your host, Johan Landgren. In the Evolution Show, we address some of the biggest challenges and opportunities of our time. And today, we look at the climate crisis. How can we solve the climate crisis or address the climate crisis with new technologies, sustainable energy in particular? And today, we have a really inspiring guest with us. To d- with us. Joachim Bistrom, the CEO and founder of Absolicon. Thank you. Welcome mm. to the Evolution Show. Thank you. You're an inventor since long, I mean, long back. Yes. Uh, perhaps we can start with that. You ah. you have been working as an you know as an entrepreneur for a long time, but before that, you've been involved in technologies for a long time. Maybe you can tell us a little bit. About well, I, I tell different stories every time, but uh, I can give you this one. When when I was a, a kid, my father worked professionally helping inventors in my home city. And I got very interested in, in doing innovations and did some ideas that I sent to an innovation competition, FinUp. And one of the ideas was to make um, um, ice um, plates that you could shoot with a gun when you throw them in the air and then you shoot them with a gun. And instead of uh, using clay that is poisonous, you have ice. And it was rewarded by the, with the second prize in this innovation competition by the Swedish king. So this was a really kickstart for my innovation interest when I was 10, 11 years old. Yeah, yeah, really interesting. And, and yeah, Absolicon, which you have developed, or your CEO and founder of right now, you have developed what I understand to be uh, the most efficient solar terminal, solar heater in the world. Yeah. Uh, but before that, you also worked at uh, the, your family company, Logosol. And your father was the founder of that. Yes, yes. Yeah. I've been developing and selling small portable sawmills all over the world. So we started in, in Sweden, going around to small markets and uh, selling those portable sawmills. And then I got responsibility for the export sales and traveled basically around the world. So I've sold 2000 sawmills in Russia. Oh, <laughs> and what, what kind of experience did you get from that, do you think, as an entrepreneur moving on to Absolicon later? Was, what was the, some of the key lessons uh, you could perhaps share with us? Yeah, I think f- from my father, I always had this with mass production and having a um, short time for each step in the processes, in the production process. But also, of course, this international experience, negotiating with people from Japan to uh, to uh, Argentina, all over the world, selling those portable sawmills. So I think I got a pretty good idea how to sell stuff. Yeah, uh, you have been really involved in the climate to address the climate crisis. You've been really mm-hmm. dedicated. Uh, I would call you perhaps a little bit like an ambassador ambassador for Sweden when it comes to climate addressing the climate mm-hmm. uh, issue. We had um, um, we had another guest uh, here. Um, uh, Ingmar Rentskog yes. from We Don't Have Time and I think you have met before. Yes, also. we went together to Al Gore's uh, training yeah. for climate reality. Yeah, and there were some other Swedes there as well. I, I don't know, but were you, were you and Ingmar and... Uh, yes, yeah. um, oh, <laughs> now I mean, you're making me embarrassed because <laughs> I should know their names. No, no, it doesn't matter. But it, the point is that you, you've been dedicated a long time to this issue and, yes. and that's I guess some of your drive uh, for behind Abs- Absolicon. Yeah, uh, I, I basically I started with Kyoto conference. Yeah. Uh, so already back then I was engaged in a youth network here in Uppsala actually. And we tried to cover all the international negotiations, the Q2000 network. So this yeah. was like my entry to these international negotiations. And 
Absolicon was basically started because I didn't feel that this international negotiation was quick enough to solve this crisis. And we sat down together, a group of friends in, in Hernesand and thought, why haven't anyone built a solar collector that can solve this problem? And instead, everyone is running on those negotiations. Mm -hmm. It's a technical issue. That yeah. was the basic start of Absolico. Yeah. And I ask, uh, I've had quite some CEOs now here and many of them, several of them like Robert Falk, they also have like you, a technical background. Mm -hmm. What role do you think that plays as an entrepreneur? Is it necessary is an advantage uh, because when you're building a company obviously it's good to have this technical know-how you understand what you're building you understand the product you understand the market but that's one part another part is also selling the uh, understanding the market and selling the product mm. and that's the economy side uh, how do you balance these do you do you think you have what what kind of um, lessons do you have with you for, as a technical mm. you have a you have studied technical physics as i understand it and how the, how have you used that experience, do you think, when you worked with Absolicon? Engineering physics has uh, been the basis of all this. And uh, I think for, from my point of view, it's a technical challenge. And then you need to have many other components as well. And I think that might be one of my strengths that actually have the whole range of experience, both financing and PR and technical development and manufacturing and sales. Yeah. So that has been one of my strong pieces to really have the full range of uh, different uh, components. But going back to Absolicon, uh, I mean, it's a super interesting company. I think it's uh, not so many know, perhaps, understand the solar heating or solar thermal uh, market, because most of the time we talk about solar panels mm. generating electricity. So mm. maybe we, we should start with what's behind the solar heaters you're developing, ve developing at, uh, Sol at Absolicon and how do they work? Yeah, the, the basic principle we started with was to focus the light because there were many different uh, solar collectors, but they all had too low temperatures. So what we concluded was that if you just could get the light concentrated, then you would get much higher efficiency and higher temperatures. Um, and there was some research in Sweden already in this field, so we could take over some of Vattenfall's work. But what was also clear was that it's a really multi-dimension challenge. It looks quite easy to make a solar concentrator, but there are 20, 30 different factors that all need to work perfectly to have a good solar collector. So it was, um, it was quite more difficult than we thought in the beginning. And this is also what we see around the world that people try to build this kind of equipment, but it's really, really difficult. Yeah. We can take a look at uh, some of the mm. technology and how it works. This is the T160. Yes. Uh, and that's the, the newest uh, product you have. Mm. You had a combination before uh, where you could generate both electricity and, and heat, but now you're focusing on, on um, heat. Yes. So now we, we focus the light on this narrow pipe in the center that gets 160 degrees hot. Yeah. And beside there is a silver mirror and the whole system is covered with uh, hardened glass okay. that is uh, anti-reflex coated and also self-cleaning. Mm -hmm. So all those three materials, the glass, the pipe and the collector mirror, they are high tech materials. So it doesn't look too much for the eye maybe, but it's a lot of work behind the yeah. collector. Yeah. And you are using these for commercial use. I mean, they're sort of large scale. Uh, it's not for hi regular housing and residential. It's more like for industri industrial installations, yes. perhaps schools and so on. Uh, when we started, we, we did installations on hotels and school and so on. And they need about uh, 200 square meters to, uh, to uh, heat a school. But then we found those industries and a small industry needs 20,000 square meters. So instead of making 100 schools, we are now aiming for one industry. So, and this was a very important insight for us that not many solar companies had uh, focused on. So we, we dropped the schools and the hotels. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, that's also kind of my follow up. Uh, what kind of, um, uh, when you look at customers, uh, what kind of, what do you, do you need? Do you need to have a, an, an industry or, or a large scale uh, demand for heat? Or are you looking, if you look ahead into the future, 
could we see perhaps uh, more uh, i mean smaller scale and for for even residential uh, yes we solutions i think um, um, our plan is to build large fields with tens of thousands of square meters mm -hmm. because we need that volume to get the price down yeah but once you got the price down yeah. then you can install everywhere yeah but you can never build this volume going to schools no. and hospitals no no you have to start from 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 small scale uh, industrial side so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a matter of scale obviously yes yeah but okay let's look at uh, mm. you had some slides here with you yes I, this is one of the scary ones i think mm -hmm. that today we who consume goods and uh, uh, pollute the world we are one billion people today but year 2050 we will be four billion people mm. And if we continue to produce uh, our cloths and our medicines and our food in the way we do today, the biosphere will not manage. No. So not only do we need to move away from uh, fossil fuels, we need to change many aspects of how we produce the li livelihood for people. Yeah. Otherwise, this four time increase will not end well otherwise. No. Uh, it's interesting you explained to me earlier that um, there's a lot of misconception when it comes to uh, you know electricity and heating if you look mm. at the demand in the world uh, looking at the market for fossil fuels so let's look at this graph uh, this diagram it's uh, yes. really interesting and it, this is one of our biggest problems is the misconception Sorry. that it is electricity that is running the world mm. because in reality it is heat and uh, I think this comes because you have the mobile phone and you have the light and so on. But if you think a little deeper, you realize that producing things require heat. If you want milk, for example, it needs to be pasteurized. Or if you have cloths, you need to wash it and dry it and so on. So the final use of energy in the world is actually electricity only 20% and heat is 49. But if you look at what uh, as, as politicians and people in general think that electricity is everything, all the policies and all the measurements that we do to, to uh, get renewable, it is put in the electricity sector. And it's only 20%. So we're missing 49 or 50% out of the picture. Mm. And in this way, put the, the industry on top. And the industry is consuming about a third of the global energy use. And you see, it's a small blue piece that is electricity, but the rest is heat. Mm. And our part is the yellow part that is heat below 150 degree degrees in industries. That's 7% of the world energy supply. Yeah. And it's just ridiculous doing producing that by burning. Things. Yeah, yeah. You should do it by solar heat. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, if I look at the efficiency rate, uh, it's 76.6% yes. uh, in your latest product in mm -hmm. T160, which is extremely high. Yes. Uh, if I think about an engine in a car, I know that most of the, uh, the movement, the motion uh, created or um, uh, the energy from, from your fossil fuel is, is wasted in heat. Uh, about 80 percent or even mm, more mm. Uh, so and uh, if you look at solar panels they have an efficiency rate of up to 23 percent mm -hmm. that's the maximum mm -hmm. when you do electricity when you do electricity but you also realize if you look at physics mm -hmm. basic physics you know that uh, so much wasted in heat and you can't mm. the problem is you can't um, because of the laws of thermodynamics mm -hmm. it's very hard to to use that uh, secondary heat uh, wasted mm. heat mm. into motion mm. um, so that's better to use the primary heat so to speak and yes. use as much of, of it as possible and I, I guess that's what you're doing with the solar thermal uh, solution yes if you have a thermal process for example we are in the tea industry mm. if you want to have uh, one ton of uh, tea in your tea bag mm. you need to burn five tons of wood yeah <laughs> so it's a lot of heat that is required to dry the, the tea leaves and of course you could in principle use electricity to heat the tea leaves but mm. why when mm. there are abundant solar heat mm. so you have an efficient solar collector to concentrate the light and produce 160 degree hot steam and you use this heat to dry the tea leaves mm. so there is no reason why we would first make electricity and and then make heat out no, of the electricity no. if you need electricity well then you do electricity and use electricity mm. but if you need heat then mm. you have a solar thermal panel and yeah. you produce heat and you store it in big tanks or pits and then you use it to cover your heat need. Yeah. Uh, Absolicon's first production line, uh, it was built here in Sweden, and you have delivered one to China. 
how does the market for solar heating look in China? Mm-hmm. And could you tell us about the experience with the production line over there? China is a fantastic uh, solar country because uh, 15 years ago they decided to really make a big push for solar thermal and they developed a system with vacuum tubes for single houses and they have installed 280 million square meters of vacuum tubes so for a small uh, single house in in China it's most often using solar thermal um, but those vacuum tubes have proven not be so good lifetime and uh, China is now looking for new technology for example concentrators mm. and at the same time they want the industry also to adopt this with solar thermal so in the five year plan there are very ambitious targets but so far it has been difficult for them to achieve them mm. and uh, the production line that we have sold to China has not been able to get into those uh, businesses and industries in the way that we thought when we saw the Chinese plans okay so mm-hmm. there are still uh, a lot of work to do in China yeah but when they decide for something they are very um, decisive and we could see that on the solar cells that Chinese government uh, landed uh, 30 million euro to 30 billion euro to the Chinese solar cell manufacturers and then the, the China could take over the world on the on the photovoltaic and we see a similar development on the solar thermal that China has identified this as an important sector. Mm. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about uh, Absolicon's business model? We mentioned the production line, that's something you sell, but you also um, get royalties for from the production. So mm. perhaps you can tell us a little bit yes. about that. Sometimes we talk about the old Absolicon and the new Absolicon. And in the old Absolicon, we sold the solar collectors to hotels and hospitals. But that was a very small business. And when we found this industrial market where you needed uh, tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of square meters, we also realized that no way we are going to send them from Sweden. We need to have a local production line. So we changed the business plan to instead of selling collectors, selling robotized production lines. And one of those robotized production lines can produce 100,000 square meters of solar collectors, 50 megawatt thermal per year. And uh, if you have a a small cluster of industries and they want to go from fossil to solar, then they can have a local production of solar collectors and and fix this. So basically we have stopped selling solar collectors globally. It's just for Sweden and so on that we do that. Okay, okay. Because my next que- next question was the what's the cost of a, of an Absolicon T one hundred solar system and if you look mm-hmm. at the the average um, return on investment time for a customer what would you say about that Yes, <clears throat> when we go to those sunny countries that has like Kenya or South Africa, they often use oil for heating and I think we in Sweden we don't think that people burn oil to get heat but that is one of the main ways people heat stuff in mm-hmm. the world. Mm-hmm. And in this kind of industry where you have a good solar radiation and you use oil for heating your process, you would have three years payback time. So compared to investing five, 10 million euro in a, in a wind farm that have maybe 12 years payback time mm-hmm. or investing five, 10 million in a solar thermal farm that have three years payback time, yeah. the solar thermal is of course a much better investment. Mm-hmm. But we are still having this problem that people think that electricity is it. Yeah, and they don't see this potential in the heat, no. so we need to convince them. And that that moves on or moves us on to what kind yeah. of industries you could use this. So here's our, some examples. Yes, I, I, I use this beam image to show that the the PV is fantastic, making electricity out of the sunlight. So if you need electricity, you should use uh, the PV panels, but they have low efficiency compared to the solar collectors. So if you want heat, you should use solar collectors. Mm. And there's no reason using the heat to make electricity or the heat electricity to make heat. No. There are two separate uses and two separate ways of Yeah, production. and you lose energy by doing the... the, the, the yeah, transition. Transition, yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, and this is, yeah, kind of explaining that it's yeah, a little bit focusing simplifying. The light. Yeah, you know how hot it can be there in the, yeah. in the burning... Uh, point yes. yeah so yeah yeah but you, and you focus. have uh, there's a lot of research behind this so you have been researching this at Uppsala University so yeah so yeah 
Uh, and this is kind of uh, mm. explaining the schematics, so to speak. Or, yes. Yeah. And this is also part of Absolucon that we have not only developed a solar collector. Mm. We have built a whole system where we know how to interface with industries. And as you see on the image, you have the solar collectors, you have a, a tank for storing the heat, you have a heat exchanger, and then you feed the heat into the industry. Mm. So it's a complete system. Mm. And you can use uh, an already existing tank or system sort of, so it becomes a kind of a hybrid, I guess. If you have, you, you get the, the solar collectors from you perhaps, uh, I guess, and you have yes. other, other systems already uh, at place. Yeah, you, you, uh, you don't take away the oil burner. No. So because sometimes you have a rainy week. Yeah. And mm. then you can use the oil burner. Mm. So the, the solar will al always be together with another other energy source. Yeah, or a vacuum pump or something something else, something, yeah, some other heating his heat source. Uh, another in industry is the dairy industry uh, that you're looking into. Yes, and this is from a f um, series of small movies that we have made for different uh, sectors. And it shows that three quarters of the energy consumption is heat and one quarter is electricity. Mm -hmm. And the electricity should, of course, come from renewable electricity mm -hmm. and the heat should come from renewable heat, for yeah. example, our solar collectors. Yeah. Uh, another mm -hmm. break up this, here? This, the, the yellow here is the electricity consumption and the red is the heat consumption for producing different dairy stuff. Like making milk, it's 70-70% heat. Cheese, 83% heat. Mm -hmm. and dry milk powder it's 92 percent heat mm. maybe you can explain what you mean that when you say it's 83 percent heat for the cheese is it because of the buildings they're just waiting wasting a lot of heat no you, no no no. You, it's the production it's the production okay. if you do a milk powder mm -hmm. you need to uh, boil away all the water so okay. that's yeah that, that's that's heat. what you mean okay mm -hmm. but also in in all um food industry there's a lot of of cleaning of the pipes mm -hmm. so two or three times a day you need to run uh, hot water and uh, um, soap through all the all the pipes mm -hmm. and this uh, requires a lot of energy in the food industry mm -hmm. so it's now the building you don't need any heat for building no. this is something special for mm -hmm. northern sweden yeah yeah but if you have like a tea factory in, in kenya or something yeah. it's a process that it's the requires. process yeah, yeah. okay mm -hmm. yeah here you have the processes so yeah everyone knows that you need to heat the milk to have it pasteurized, to mm. kill off all the bugs. Mm. But you also need some heat where you separate the different parts of the milk. You have this clean in place process where you uh, clean all the pipes and then the dry milk uh, production. Mm. All those heat driven processes. Mm. And it's another industry. Yes, also. the breweries, you can jump to the next one. Yeah. When you make beer, first you need to uh, heat the, the mashing mm. and then you need to boil it mm. and then you need to uh, to uh, wash the bottles mm -hmm. and then before you send the bottles to the consumer you need to heat them up and pasteurize them otherwise they will continue to brew and explode in the shop <laughs> so all of these are are heat processes mm -hmm. and then of course you need a little electricity because you have the laptop you have the light you have some pumps mm -hmm. but the process are heat process mm -hmm. another industry that might be interesting for your product yes the textile industry, we are actually a little surprised because we had the impression that, well, the textile industry, they use a lot of electricity because they have all these sewing machines and so on. Mm. But as you see on the on the chart, it's only 15 percent that is electricity. So mm. because to um, handle the cloth is very, very heat consuming. First, you need to bleach it in hot baths, then you need to dye it, then you need to wash it and then you need to dry it. <laughs> So this small sewing machine, it's nothing no. compared to enormous heat consumption. Mm. And often, most often this is done by coal. So the, the textile industry has a big coal depth. For every one kilo of cloth that you buy in the shop, you could bring also two kilo of coal <laughs> because you need to burn <laughs> two kilo of coal for every one kilo of cloth. Mm. So it's, um, now we didn't know that before. And I think many of the people working even in the textile industry does not really understand how much fossil fuel that is burned to produce uh, cloth. No, no. Uh, here I have a map of uh, the direct uh, normal irradiation mm -hmm. on, the, yeah, exactly. on the globe. And you can see those uh, yellow and reddish places that are excellent for our product. Mm -hmm. But uh, we should also know that one of the biggest solar thermal markets in the world is Denmark. And you see Denmark is on the green side here. Mm -hmm. So yellow, five years payback time. 
green seven years payback time mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's only a question of uh, how, how much how quick do you want the money back yeah and if you check there in, in chile you can see some uh, almost pink color mm-hmm. and on those copper mines that uses enormous amount of expensive diesel fuel we actually get about one year's payback time okay wow yes yeah that's amazing you have some example from the textile industry. Yes. Yeah. And, and this is actually a tool that we have developed because making those estimations how what the payback time is in different industries has usually been a very troublesome procedure. But now we have that what we call the field simulator. And I was recently in Ethiopia and met the textile factory. And I could simply Google up ethno Japan Syntec textile. And I got this map to the left and I draw the field. Mm-hmm. That would be a 27,000 square meter footprint mm-hmm. and about half the area would be solar collectors. Mm-hmm. And after the tool is doing some calculation, we end up with three years payback time. Mm. So here you, in 30 seconds, you can tell, is this a good industry or not to convert to solar thermal? Mm-hmm. And yeah. uh, looking at emissions, this is a... Yeah, this is a plan that we did for a textile industry mm-hmm. that today burn uh, coal. Mm-hmm. And we could show that by investing in uh, um, solar thermal panels and in, uh, re- in uh, biofuel, they could in three steps get down to zero in CO2 emissions. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's really no reason why the textile industry would not have zero CO2. No. And H&M, for example, have set very ambitious goals to cut their CO2 emissions. Mm-hmm. To 2030, they will cut the emissions from the purchased cloth with 59%. Wow. But that requires now a, a textile factory who want to sell to H&M and mm-hmm. today have a certain combustion of oil, of um, coal. Mm-hmm. They really need to switch. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, looking at solar thermal collectors. Uh, just before we move on here, uh, I thought um, the obvious question a lot of people asking is in terms of maintenance, if you look oh. compared to solar panels, uh, what are we looking at and uh, in terms of warranty perhaps and so on? Mm. Uh, are they comparable? I, I know that you're talking about 25 years yes, when it comes yes. to solar panels. What do you, can you expect and, and of course cost if you if you yes. buy this? No, it's, it's basically no maintenance with mm. them. Mm-hmm. Um, they are following the sun, mm-hmm. so there is some mechanics that you need to keep an eye on. Yeah. But we have systems that have been up and running for almost 10 years with minimum maintenance. Yeah. So well, we know. And this is actually an important barrier to entry if someone tried to make, make this, because it's difficult to get 10 years experience from a field. Yeah. But yeah. we have that. We know it works. Yeah. And we haven't mentioned that you said that now that there are solar, these are, have solar trackers. Yes. Um, a lot of uh, solar panels do not. Uh, no. So that's something you also have been working on, I guess. It's always uh, yeah. faced directly to the sun. Yeah. And um, well, we spent uh, hundreds of thousands of euro going different routes here, but yeah. in the end, we bought a system from Siemens. Okay. Mm-hmm. And it's been working, I, I assume, so far. It's not yes. been a, because I, when I think about it, it's kind of mechanical stuff. It mm. t- it c- can you know uh, break down, but yes. uh, so far it's been working. And, yeah. and that's mm-hmm. the same with all the components that you need to go for those high quality components yeah. when you build this. Mm. And we see this in India, for example, where people try to build collectors like mm. this, and after two years, it's just a scrapyard. Mm. So uh, I think here we really know how to do it. And, yeah. and people can come to Sweden and see how our collectors that have been out with one meter of snow and the storms and everything, and they look like new. Yeah. Uh, I, I just uh, My favorite picture. Yeah. You see, ever since I was a kid, I was very interested in robotics. Mm-hmm. And when we made those collectors now that was the best in the world, we could produce two a day, mm-hmm. building them manually. Mm-hmm. And we want to change the energy situation of the world. And we can't do that if we do two collectors a day. No. So we asked our shareholders and we brought in 3 million euro to build and uh, develop this production line. Mm-hmm. And here it is. Mm-hmm. And instead of making two collectors every day, it makes one collector every six minutes. Wow. Okay. Mm-hmm. So uh, here you have two large ABB robots and five people mm-hmm. that work together. And um, you start with, there is no, um, you start with raw material mm-hmm. and then comes a finished uh, solar collector. Mm-hmm. So it's a very rational and, and cheap production. Yeah. Uh, and this is uh, the one you delivered in China. Yes. And it's pretty much the same, I guess. Yes, it's, it's the same right? as we have in, in Sweden. Mm-hmm. And this was a really um, 
a, a very exciting journey with a Chinese customer and mm -hmm. delivering this production mm -hmm. line it went very well. And you mentioned we have talked a little bit about it already, but so far, how, how has the demand been in China for the solar collectors? Is it do you see a trend that it's you know raising interest with this uh, pilot? Oh, mm, I think what happened in China was that the, this uh, production plan was uh, asked from the government to be installed. Mm -hmm. And they might not have this entrepreneur sales ability. No. So they are mainly waiting to win those large public uh, bids. Okay. Tenders. Okay. And they haven't really developed the way that we had hoped. No. But the production line is there and mm -hmm. we see that the Chinese market hasn't either developed really the way we wanted. No. So mm -hmm. we are looking for more opportunities in China. Mm -hmm. So here you have 10 patent families currently. Yes. Yeah. And here I think when you're a, a company like a technology company, you can choose a little. Do you want to have secrets or do you want to have patents and how to go around? But we decided to go with protecting our material rights. So mm. we both have patents and we have also different kind of um, um, design protections. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the picture is Patrick is our patent engineer working 80% only doing patents for Absolco. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is ongoing projects or negotiations you have yes. at the moment. Um, last year, we when we had this final final conclusion on yes, we have the best solar collector in the world, and we got the test results and everything. <laughs> then we started this switch from being a technology company to being a business development company, and we had too many inquiries that we we didn't we couldn't answer the inquiries so we asked our shareholders for money for making a market uh, project you could say we called it open new markets mm -hmm. and uh, the result of it is that we signed those uh, three production lines the south africa the kenya and one on cyprus and mm -hmm. all those dots are places where we are working on production line yeah and now we are from this experience the past year investing about 900,000 euro selling three production lines we are now raising 5 million euro okay. to do just more of the same yeah so we will fill the map with dots yeah. and sign a lot of production yeah. lines but if you compare them to china uh, in kenya for example is it also government uh, uh, supported or is it more a market approach uh, companies also yes no it's very different actually in in south africa and kenya we have worked together with build multinational companies to start with who want to have the solar heat mm. and out of that we have grown a uh, entrepreneur that can run the production line and, and finance the production line mm. so they're more a demand side uh, process mm. and uh, we just signed a very very good agreement with uh, inbev that have budweiser and corona beer okay. in mm. mozambique mm -hmm. breweries mm. breweries yes. yes and they are the biggest brewery in the world Okay. With 225 breweries all around. All right. So, so that's the way yeah, the, the, the pool for the production lines. Yeah. And uh, if you look at the economy of this, um, I, re I read in your magazine that you expect to be cash flow um, positive mm -hmm. in 2022. Yes. Uh, so that's, that's not so far away. Mm -hmm. And is that based on selling your production lines and your royalties? Uh, or Yes. Yeah. That's your plan. And some solar collectors. So yeah. it's a mix. Yeah. And it seems like you you raised so much interest now, so you, you're sticking to that plan. You you think you can manage yes. reach that goal? Yes. Yeah. Interesting. So we we put um, um, it, when you're a stock listed company as we are, mm -hmm. um, often when you're a, a technology a small technology company, you don't put out this kind of goal because you really put out your neck, you know. Yeah. But we put this to have a 10 million euro and positive cash flow. Yeah. And also to be ready to be listed on the big uh, Swedish stock exchange on Nasdaq uh, Stockholm yeah. in three years. So. Yeah. So it's that's your your kind of uh, plan to to raise capital because that's also my question. If you need to expand now rapidly, you might be you might need to, to raise more capital than just the one you get from your revenues, mm -hmm. your revenue streams. Or do you, do you think that? Well, uh, it, as we said in 2022, we should be cash flow positive. Mm -hmm. But that with a, a conservative growth rate. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if we see that there are opportunities, we will ask our shareholders if they think we should go for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I think Absolicon has an opportunity to actually cover a large part of the heat demand for the industries globally. Mm -hmm. And we can create, if we get 
10 production lines up and running around the world, it will be very tricky for any Chinese or any other company to catch up on that advantage. Mm. Because with 10 production lines, the component cost will be so low. Yeah. So it will be tricky, tricky to compete with us. Yeah, it's kind of similar to Tesla that their goal going from a premium luxury to, a, to you know, yeah. a, a cheaper yeah. car. It's you have to go that way. I think it's yes. obvious. But, but okay, let just finally then, what if you look ahead five years uh, in terms of production lines? What can you expect? Do you think you have a, you can continue on this? to raise uh, interest and uh, do you have set up s- some goals for that or? Mm. Well, I think that in the end, all regions in, in the world who want to switch from from uh, fossil to solar, they need their own production line. Mm. A production line can, can um, fulfill the needs of a few million people. Mm. So then you can calculate how many production lines that is in, in theory needed. Yeah. And then it's partly up to the politicians how fast this transition could go, mm. because there's a lot of money needed and a lot of uh, development. Even if it's three year payback time, you still need to have the capital. Yeah, the customers needed to, to get your line, production line, yes. obviously. And a lot of investments for the solar collectors as yeah. well. Yeah. In, in the end, we need about $1 trillion yeah. to finance the solar collectors for the industry. Mm. Mm. And that then it's not good just to have commercial purchases. You need the big money. Well. No, no. And we, as we have talked about on the show a lot, uh, we're running out of time. So we mm. really have to, you know, step yes. up. And uh, so finally, uh, if As you a, look, that sorry. was also a reason why we make the production lines. Yeah. Because we can scale very, very fast now. Mm. We can, in a few years, we can cover the world with production lines. Ah. If we just had one Tesla factory, mm. it would take us ages to yeah. build cars for everyone. Yeah. But we build factories everywhere. Yeah. Interesting. So finally, if you look ahead, uh, what's the biggest milestone you expect to see if you look just a year or j- this year ahead for Absolicon? Are you on track or can you tell us something yes. about what's uh, going getting on? Getting those uh, production lines up in South Africa and Kenya and getting mm. the production going, that will be the, the big stuff. Yeah. And then, of course, signing more framework agreements around the world mm. and signing with companies like we had another interesting deal also. We signed with the biggest desalination company in the world, mm-hmm. in Saudi Arabia. Okay. They want to run our collectors to make uh, uh, water for Saudi Arabia. That sounds good in t- their climate and they kind of yes. have so much heat. So. And you know, they have a problem. They have about half their water comes from desalination mm-hmm. and half the water comes from deep uh, w- d- well, wells. Mm-hmm. And now those uh, are running out of water. Yeah. So they need to double the capacity for mm. desalination. Mm. And today they run the desalination by burning oil. Yeah, I know. All pi- all power power plants. Yeah. It's yeah. But how will they run the desalination in the future? No, exactly. It's not sustainable. So but and that's something we are, we're going to address in the second part of this. <laughs> today we talked a lot about Absolokan and a little bit more about the technology. But as as I mentioned, you're very dedicated to the climate issue and there's so many obvious connections to what you do with Absolokan. So we're going to dig deeper into that in the part two of this conversation. But for now, thank you so much, ah, uh, Joachim. You. It was really interesting. I learned a lot. (laughs) You're welcome. Thank you. If you enjoyed this conversation as well, feel free to continue the conversation in the comments below. As always, we appreciate your feedback. Was it good or bad? In the second episode, in the second part of this conversation, I'll be back with Joachim Byström to look more into the details of how we can address the climate issue with new smart solar technologies like Absolicon. I hope to see you next week.